Uh, you're going to release your team total talent rankings here very soon on Michigan podcast slash the bigger 10 and also your coaches rankings. I am uh, happy to have a preview of all of this. So a few teams that jumped out to me, BYU at number seven yeah. and this. So where the, where, where this caught me, Steve, was that you have always touted this as a ceiling. And I believe I understand the, the process, this as a ceiling for that particular team. And that seems ultra high for even a ceiling for BYU at number seven. I originally came up with this metric mark because I thought there was a missing link in analyzing analytics like with uh, uh, Bill Conley, who's a hard lefty, by the way, but I love his work. I read everything he writes about college football. Okay. Um, he came up with, you know, his, uh, his advanced metrics and measuring how good teams are based on what we know about them. And a lot, a lot of his, his metric is based on what he calls returning production. And I loved how he went beyond, you know, you and I, when we were growing up, just used to grab the magazines and count returning starters. Right. And that would give us an idea of who was in a cycle up or a cycle down year most of the time. Okay. And so, uh, you know, Bill realized that with the, with the advent of specialization in college football, like in the NFL, sub packages and things of that nature, that lots of guys aren't necessarily starters, but they're playing 40, 50, 60 snaps a game. So how do we account for them? And so that's where he came up with this new metric of returning production. When I started this in 2017, though, what I wanted to find out was who had a roster that it looked like they were overall prepared to underperform or overperform their typical baseline of expectation one way or the other. Meaning who are the guys on that roster we've never even heard of yet. And that's why I came up with this talent rating using the recruiting uh, composite ratings at 24 seven. What this year is teaching me though, is I'm not, I'm not sure how to do it. And I, I almost wonder if I shouldn't do it anymore is the advent of NIL has created a certain amount of loopholes in the system. I am, I am fairly confident based on the data I have that Michigan and BYU just are not just are, 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 are beyond 85 man scholarship limits. And I'm sure not, they're not the only ones. Okay. I, I just know it's those two. One, I know the Michigan roster better than any other because I follow it all year round. And I just had to reconstruct since BYU, this is their first year in the power five. I've never done BYU before. So I had no returning numbers for them. So I had to construct it from Adam. I had to start from the very beginning, all right? Which meant I got, I got a chance to look at their entire roster, not with any leftover data from what I had, had accumulated and curated throughout the course of the year, but from, from whole cloth, I had to recreate it. And it's pretty clear they're over the 85-man scholarship limit. And that's how they got to that total. And what you're going to need to do now is, is you're going to have to reconcile that more aggressively with power ratings because I think they're right ahead of your boys at Ohio State, right? And in, in what I have right now. Yes. Okay. But while they may have more points in volume, would you? Who, no one in their right mind, including Kalani Sataki, would trade BYU's roster for Ohio State's. He'd take the other trade. All right. And so uh, the 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 advent of NIL and and we still have all these COVID extra years. We still have one more year after this, I believe. Uh, I I think these roster numbers are in, in, a, in a few cases are harder to quantify because you're able to just use NIL. Like I can just tell, remember I told you last year when you got all upset at me about Michigan being more talented than Ohio State, then we went out there and beat your ass by 20 points, but I won't bring that up. All right. Remember this time last year though, you were incensed at me about this. Remember, and I told you Michigan was five players over the scholarship limit. And at some point those guys will have to be re relieved and you'll probably be ahead of us. Remember I told you that, right? Yes. We never relieved those guys, Mark. So what that tells me is Michigan is just using NIL to augment scholarship caps. And that's one of the reasons why Michigan's been able to keep guys who normally would be third day NFL draft picks and would already moved on, getting them to come back or even second day picks like Blake Corum. You're getting them to come back now because you're using NIL to basically pay for their education and more. And that helps you to, to supersede the 85 man scholarship limit. And based on the numbers that I saw going through BYU's roster, I think they're doing the exact same thing. And I, and I, and I think you'll note, I made a note of that uh, in my, in what I sent you too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get away from the specific rankings. We can deal with those later. Let's. But uh, remember like what I am looking for are teams that I think looking at betting markets for win totals 
are the, is their overall roster in a cycle up or cycle down year? That's why I'm doing this. I'm looking for that. Absolutely. So I'm I'm going to get away from everything that I that I'm looking at regarding specific teams. We can deal with that later, and we want people to um, see your unveiling here. I'm going to go to kind of conceptualize some things here. Uh, so yes, you are trying to relate your your rankings to win totals. So is that a direct line to say 250 equals six and a half wins against this schedule? Are you able to do it in such a way? No, what I do is look at, because I keep these year by year. And so I am comparing where is your roster at to its mean, to its norm, all right? Are you in a progression to the mean or a regression to the mean, okay? So like TCU right now, I have as the least, in terms of depth, the least talented team in the Big 12. Now, would I take TCU or Houston's, because they're in the Big 12 now, remember, would I take TCU or Houston's top 22, 11 starters on each side? Which one would you take? I'd I take TCU. TCU's, and I wouldn't even think about it, okay? Yeah. But because TCU's win total is going to be inflated based on what they did last year, all right, what my numbers are telling me is play the under. That as we go through a season and depth becomes an issue, they don't have the depth that they've had in the that they had last year, for example. Remember the guy that was the runner-up for the Heisman Trophy? Wasn't even going to be the starting quarterback, remember. The other guy got hurt. He came off the bench. My numbers are telling me this, this is the year they don't have the capacity to withstand those kinds of challenges to their depth. Does that maybe more answer your question of what I'm saying? Okay. Ohio State has recently lost some guys in the transfer portal late that in past years they would not have lost. Okay. So, again, am I, am I going to take Ohio State's top 22 over any other top 22 in the Big Ten, with the possible exception of Michigan's? Yes. But my numbers are also telling me that based off the attrition between the draft and the transfer portal, it's not necessarily a year where Dalen Hayes is going to come off the bench and run for 200 yards against Maryland. may not be that kind of a year for Ohio State. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for outliers. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not necessarily looking for this tells me this point total means you're going to go eight and four because the schedules are a variable too. They change year in and year out. What I'm looking, what, 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 so I'll just tell you how I do it. When I look at those numbers, I'm looking for, all right, this team's down from where they were, noticeably down, not like 10 points or so, okay? Noticeably down. That's why I had TCU on my brain. They are noticeably down from where they were. So this team is noticeably down or this team is noticeably up. Let me look at their schedule. Let me see what their win total is. Do I see a path, given what I think of their, my numbers show me of their overall roster, that they can go, markedly and that would be more than a half of a game markedly above or below their win total and if and it's not that many teams that's why i, I put out win total best bets for fewer than usually uh usually no more than seven or eight teams a year my record on these has been very very good there's only a few outliers you know most of the time the win totals you see even in may are pretty close to what my projections of their win totals are there's very few outliers and your record last year for the win totals do you remember off the top of your head? I want to say was it I want to say it was six and two, I think is what it was last year. I'd have to go back and look, but I know it was something like that. So they came out, I believe, last week on DraftKings. Uh mm -hmm. the win totals came out last week. And if week. I had a chance to examine them closely, I usually do that over Memorial Day weekend. So now you know what my next weekend's plans are. Yes. Well, I was doing a live stream and I was just curious because people were hitting me with win totals. So I went back to my response to your uh total team talent rankings and, and the win totals. And I looked at what I projected last year and I'm not anywhere close to what you have produced in this. Uh, I did produce a six and two win totals mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I was, I, I kind of lucked into this and then I was three and two. And then late in the process, I looked at Georgia, Ohio state, Michigan, 10 and a half, 10 and a half, 10 and a half. And I was like, take them all over <laughs> uh, because you're going to hit two out of those three. Definitely. Exactly. So take all three of them. Exactly. Like you got on me about betting Stanford last year and being, I was high on them going over the win total. And obviously they did not, but, but here's the thing. That's the, that's what you do with the system. You know, remember years ago, Phil, you used to hear Phil Steele say, well, my computer says this, but I'm going to overrule my computer. Okay. Um, the, the minute that you start in my view that you, you start handpicking when you're going to follow your system and when you're not, I think that's a dangerous place to be. I think you're better off embracing your system. Now, if your system 
if my if your system is my system wasn't like Stanford was going to go seven and five. Just my system thought they were going to win five games and their win total was four. OK, three and a half in some places. If my system had come back and said Stanford's going to go eight and four, I'd have said, well, I think my some of my system, you know, but if you if you start trying to outgame your system, I just think you get in a lot of trouble that way. It, it, to me, if if you're if you're you either follow your system or you don't trust the integrity of your system. Yeah, you need to tweak the system. Yep, exactly, exactly. So the coaches' ratings go into this figure, correct? They do not. They go into my overall preseason preview when it comes out in July. All right, that the the coach ratings are important to me because they essentially determine ties. If, if, because the way I do my preview is a projection of the upcoming season. So I'm projecting out every game, how I think the polls will go in response. And um, what do I do when a team is power rated very similarly? Um, or I don't think, or I think situationally, there's not one advantage over another. You know, like you're, you get a team off a bye week and you're on your second consecutive road game. That's a situational advantage, right? Okay. And so the coach ratings is basically my tiebreaker, which, which coaches right now do I have more? Do I trust more, and uh, against the against the profession as a whole, and then each other in individual circumstances, and that goes into the overall power rating. And I have a grid. What I what I do every year before I, I w and w and pardon me before I w and l the system is I have a database where I break every team down, both their talent rating, the coach rating, each positional rating, and I do it. In how they how I rate them in regards to their overall conference. All right. And the reason why is even for Notre Dame, five games they play every year is the ACC. That's 40% of their schedule. For everybody else, 70, 70, 75% of your schedule you're playing are teams in your own conference. Right. So it's the most important, consistent, because you're always looking when you're doing numbers, is you're all you're looking um, for the most data. And the and so I the the data that's going to be the most credible to me is the is that what you've done against teams that know you play you and um you know and therefore there's you know on a traditional level they have a familiarity that you know out, outranks mystique per se and you're still not going to take my suggestion to overvalue the quarterback well i i i, I do overvalue the quarterback um one of the things that i will do when i when i go through my grid is i will assign a win range as if where I think where I think this team before I even look at their schedule, what is their win range? Are they in, and it's a two game range? All right, is it a two to four win team, a four to six win team, a six to eight win team, a eight to ten win team, a ten to twelve win team? And I always put a star by teams that have a proven returning quarterback. They I usually move them up uh, a win range if that makes sense. That's usually what I'll do. 